Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Um, OK, so today, over the next 50 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about why all security initiatives are doomed to fail and hopefully some things you can do about it. There are three key takeaways that hopefully, if you remember nothing else, hopefully you remember these three things by the end of my talk. The first is understanding how workflows is fundamental. You need to understand how work actually gets done across the business to be able to enact change at scale, and that is one of the fundamental things in security you have to do. The second is you need to be constraint aware. I'm going to talk quite a lot about theory of constraints, Eli Goldratt, all that kind of good stuff, and how that applies to knowledge work today. And I'm also kind of going to talk why Agile doesn't scale across teams and what you can do instead. And there's kind of two principles that are kind of the basis, or basis for all this. One is developers are both the cause of and the solution to all problems. And the second is security is about influence, not execution. Security, much like consulting, is more a game of influencing people. Um, you might have seen Gregor wandering around. He talks about it in terms of architecture, living in the first derivative, which is a particularly mathy, nerdy way of talking about it. But effectively, it's about getting people to do the right thing and looking at the trends over time more than any absolute position. So Chris very kindly in introduced um, me earlier. Yeah, um, I'll just do a shout out for Beer Ops because it was the first time it was run in Brisbane a few weeks ago. It is Australia's biggest tech networking event. It runs in Perth, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. It's free to attend, kind of wonderful. Uh, it'll be back mid-year next year. If you didn't get to go a, couple, a few weeks ago, definitely worth heading down. So being hailing from Perth, uh, at least at the moment, I like quokkas a little bit too much, as we all do over there. And this is a white-badged uh, story of an enterprise I worked with in the UK. But effectively, they were trying to digitally transform. I'm still looking for a good definition for that. So if anyone has one, please come and tell me later. They were doing Agile. In this case, it was safe, but you can take less or any of kind of the scale Agile frameworks that don't work. And I will <laughs> have some more points about that as we go along. And the third point is security was working harder than ever with this. This was no fault and never is a fault on effort. I never really believe that anyone isn't working as hard as they can to do the right thing. But sometimes, or I'd argue a lot of the time, that's just not enough. That's not actually going to get you where you need to be. And kind of what I've discovered in my career is hitting keyboards or people can only get you so far to pursuing an initiative. So we need to think about things in a bit of a different way. And what you commonly find in digital transformations, especially when there's kind of this push to do things in a modern way, but there's, oh my god, almost such legacy behind you, is you end up with this dual speed IT function where effectively you've got teams that are trying to run off into the distance and teams that you just wish would move at all. And you've kind of got to balance the both. And I, you know, I kind of think it's kind of like Spider-Man trying to hold two sides together. You've got mainframe on one side and Kubernetes on the other. And everything is just kind of awful. And while we always talk about the idea that we think people's processes, tools in that order, the reality is that everyone tries to tool their way out of people problems. And this ends up being you know, a problem that we have to tackle that the vendor industry, such as they are, like to sell you a tool that will be magic and silver bullet and all those wonderful things. The reality is it's never like that. And even when the tool is good, it often dies because of the way the business works. It's never the tool's problem, real, oh, nearly, <laughs> nearly never the tool's problem, but fundamentally, it becomes a people problem. Now, I'm going to pick on cloud security posture management today because this is uh, almost a ubiquitous tool pickup when you're doing digital transformation as you're going into cloud. Effective it's the thing that has all the alerts and windows at you, the people are doing things badly in the cloud. That's effectively what it does. And yeah, in, in this case, um, this enterprise, they were spending, their CSPM tool was costing them about a million dollars per annum. If you haven't gone through the conversations with the vendors, this is pretty a standard price at enterprise scale. And what they've done was the first year, they're like, okay, security has budget, we're going to buy it. And after that first year, what we're going to do is going to make everyone else pay for it. Um, which got really interesting when they got to the end of the first year and everyone went, what is this tool? What does it do? What value have you given me over the last year? And when you look at kind of what the tool tells you, and I said it's effectively whinging at scale with CSPM, you end up with something like this, where the amount of controls in the CSPM, the amount of things you're looking at is going up over time. But when you actually look at the problems it's finding, they're always increasing, 
and the average age is increasing. Like we're not actually getting on top of the things that are actually problems. Instead, we're just looking at everything easier. And as, if you're familiar with John Boyd's OODA loop, you know observe is the first point. You're kind of supposed to go through the rest of the loop, and that's kind of where it gets stuck a lot of the time in terms of you have this ability to see everything, but then we actually try and go to act, nothing really happens. So, yeah, the security posture was fundamentally eroding over time, the finding problems faster than can fix them, and it forces you into this really reactive of a proactive approach because you just see all the fires going on and you're trying to put them out, but you can't really actually get in front of anything. Okay, so one thing that they needed to do was understand how work flows through a business. And the best model that I found um, for looking at this kind of stuff is value streams, which we'll talk about kind of from please to thank you. So from idea to value, how do you go from we had an idea about something to it's in the hands of a consumer and they're appreciative of it. They can be owned by one team or split across teams. And for what I'm gonna talk about today, there's kind of two key metrics I wanna talk about with value streams. The first is throughput which is how many units are delivered per unit time. This can look like 1.6 stories a day. It can look like 10 stories a sprint. It can, you, know, you can kind of figure out what works for you. And the second is the lead time for a unit to be delivered. I'm saying three days here. So from we put starting working on it to being done is three days. Now, in your companies, that can vary wildly. I've seen under a day, and I've seen over 90 days. It's highly variable business to business, but it's a, these are key metrics to understand in here. So it's kind of how much are you doing and how long does it take to get stuff done? And fundamentally, an organization is made of a bunch of different value streams that are all trying to deliver value to someone, maybe external, maybe internal. And where you see businesses trying to go with different measures of success is to try to go to this concept of product teams where they have a value stream, they own it end to end, they do everything autonomously, everything is great, everything is sphere of control, and to date it's the best way we've found of delivering value to end users. And you can find all this literature on it, like um, Inspired and Empowered, which are both fantastic books to go and read. There's gonna be a lot of books, so if you wanna take photos of the books to go along, please feel free. One problem though, security isn't a product team. We can't work like this. This is not how it actually works for us in security. Because the reality is, ours looks more like this. So we do work, and that feeds into other, other teams who need to actually do the work. We're kind of serving it up, and they've actually got to hit the serve. We can't do it all ourselves. So when you go and read all the wonderful literature about product teams and value, value streams and all that kind of stuff, you're like, OK, cool, but that doesn't really apply to me, because that's not the nature of the system I'm actually working in. I can't do that. So what can you do instead? So, becoming constraint aware. This is where we start diving into theory of constraints. You may have come across it before. It's not often applied to knowledge work for no particularly good reason than engineers being arrogant. Like many things we eventually adopt because we thought we were special and find out we're not in the fullness of time. This is one of those scenarios. So if you're not familiar with theory of constraints, I'm gonna do a light touch over it. If you want a deep touch, come and see me afterwards. But effectively, in any system, there is exactly one constraint. That constraint dictates how much throughput you can get through at any one point in time. And investing away from the constraint is pure waste. And that's why adding more project managers never makes a project go quicker. They are never actually the constraint on actually making anything happen. Instead, they just like to um, tell other people they should work harder. So it's just one of those problems in there. And when you dive into theory of constraints, it has this scientific method for looking at constraints and constantly, um, continuously improving the throughput of a system. So the first step is find the constraint, and I'll talk about how you do that in knowledge work. Second is how to optimize the constraint, and again, I'll talk about that. Then subordinate to the constraint, which is a fancy way of saying effectively allow the constraint to dictate how you release work into the system. So don't just start releasing work if the constraint is too busy. The fourth one is elevating the constraint, which is going, okay, if this is the thing that's slowing us down or making, setting how fast we can go, the obvious thing to do is go, how do we make this go faster? Because that will then allow us to do more. And the fifth is iterate. So, you know, you look from lean theory and continuous improvement, Kaizen, all those kind of things. This is not something that's one and done. This is something you do continually up until you hit a constraint you can no longer elevate. And that's normally like budget or um, amount of people. You can constantly go, and at some point it's like, well, there's no more money to invest, so we're going as fast as we can. Fantastic. If anyone's actually in that position, that's amazing. I've never actually met anyone in that position, but that's the theory of kind of what sets the uh, overall constraint on this. 
Just to talk a little bit more deeply about constraints themselves, this is kind of the crux of a lot of what I'm going to talk about. The first is we want to keep constraints optimally fed. Now, what do I mean by that? You never want to starve a constraint. You never want the constraint sitting idle and not doing work because that is lost time you cannot get back. You're just throwing value away. And the other one is you never want to overload the constraint. And this is where I get into an argument with my wife about multitasking. It is a myth. All the research backs me, yet she reckons she can still do it. And to be honest, when I see her, sometimes I agree with her. But the idea is that you don't want to multitask at constraints here. You want to have it kind of working through just as much work as it can most optimally and do that over time. When you look at like task switching and all that kind of stuff and debating priorities, these are just wasteful activities to do. Even in humans, you have attention residue and all that kind of stuff that says that as you're trying to swap between different things, your performance goes down massively on any one thing. Same thing actually applies when you look at systems and teams. And we want to release work as the constraint becomes available. That's kind of the key to getting away from multitasking, going the constraint's going to have time to work on something, so let's release work so it gets there in time. Coming back to how this applies to security, the constraint is always outside the security team. It's never actually the security team that is dictating the throughput of the system. It's all the product teams and all the other people that are actually dictating how fast you can get security done. Work enters, the, work enters this really murky sphere of influence where instead of me being able to control it, all of a sudden I have to try and get other people to do things, which is hard and messy. And so given this is the reality, we need to understand how to optimize this. How do you understand this? How do you optimize this? How do you actually work within this? when this is the reality. If that section was particularly interesting to you and you want to know kind of where a lot of this content um, originally came from, there's a series of books called the Tame Flow books. If you're familiar with the DDD books, it's kind of like they're left to right, they're green, red, blue. So I'd start on the one that has first underneath it. Don't start with third because the third one is probably about 10 hours read. The first one's about two hours and you can kind of work backwards as you go in deeper. I'd also suggest um, a prodigious amount of caffeine when you read it as well. It gets quite deep quite quickly, um, but it's really, really interesting stuff. So, take, making this a little bit more real in here, if we look at an infrastructure configuration change that we're trying to do, and you can start to map of like, okay, we've got a security team, we're gonna, fi I, the classic example is like a misconfigured S3 bucket, because that's kind of the classic cloud problem that gets people in the news occasionally here and there. So the security team's going to set up a bit of work that they want other teams to do. And given these are average lead times for each team. So you can see security team, when we've got something, it will take us about a week to do it. Then product team one's going to take two weeks. Product team two is going to take one week to do it. And product team three is going to take three weeks to do it. And then at the end, we've got security at the back end to kind of trust but verify, make sure people actually did it so we can verify that all the alerts that are going off have now turned off. So if we set up a backlog here of four different bits of infrastructure configuration, it doesn't matter their infrastructure configuration, and this is, these are problems that all three teams have and we need them all to fix. If we actually start kind of playing through what happens given average lead times, after one week, after two weeks, after three weeks, after four weeks, after five weeks, we end up at this point. So in terms of like being able to close off a particular vulnerability as closed, we've managed to do that for one thing after five weeks. And where we've actually got, we've got a few different bottlenecks in the system here. So product team one's got um, four weeks of work ahead of it. The security team's actually also got four weeks of work ahead of it. And product team three actually has eight weeks of work ahead of it. And that then would tell us that project team three is the constraint on the work we're trying to do. So the thing that's actually dictating how, close, how quickly we can get work through and get it finished and closed off is product team three. So finding the constraint is effective. You play the backlog of work through that model, and you find the team with the longest queue in time. This isn't necessarily the most tickets. It's the most time sitting in front of any one team, and that will tell you which team is then the constraint. So when someone asks you why you know, your security initiative is falling behind, you can point at, well, it's that team. They're the, they're the people who are slowest. They're the people actually making it hard for us. We don't necessarily want to um, point blame around, but you actually have an ability to actually answer that question properly as opposed to, well, I don't know, we're working hard. So if we look at just changing this up slightly, so yeah, okay, spotlight's working. So if you actually look at the three teams, the colors underneath each team dictate what colors of work is for them. Here. So product team two has to do everything in the backlog. Product team three only has two items, and product team one has to do three in here. All we've done is we've changed the backlog, the contents of the backlog slightly to match up better to the system we're actually working with and the different speeds in here. 
So if we actually play this through over five weeks, this is the same amount of time elapsed. And you can fundamentally see this looks a lot healthier and a lot cleaner than it did before. You know, that's what it was before, and that's what it is now. We've got more work done. There's kind of less work piling up. This actually gives us some level of agility because we haven't sat a massive backlog in front of a team in terms of waiting for them to have time to do things. And when you actually play this forward in time to 12 weeks, just based on this kind of simple model, the initial model where we were kind of just throwing work at every team, not really thinking about it, we got three things done and the average lead time is four weeks. When we changed the shape of the backlog, we got those same three things done. We also got an extra four things done and um, the lead time went down to 1.7 weeks. All we did was shape the work around the constraint. No team worked faster. We didn't have to actually change. We didn't have to actually talk to anyone to do this, fundamentally. We didn't have to talk to any of the teams. We just played to the reality of the system we're working within, as opposed to kind of being naive of that and kind of just going, we'll throw work at it and see what happens. For me, this really is a definition of working smarter, not harder. No one had to work any harder to make this happen, yet we actually got more than twice as much stuff done in the same amount of time. So security in an agile world. I'm going to talk a bit about agile planning here, about how to maximize value over time, and kind of the tongue in cheek name I like for its professional fortune telling, right? I think we've all been through agile planning. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's a thing. So if anyone's come across WSJF before, if you've suffered through SAFE, as I'm sure some people in the room will have done, it's way the shortest job first, and effectively it's in the idea of how do we maximize the amount of value we're getting. Cost, it, it's an economic model that uses cost of delay over job size to effectively go how do we get the most value for our most bang for our buck consistently through. With, yeah, value over effort. The problem with WSGF is what it changes in a multi-team scenario. When you've got just one team working amongst themselves, you can WSGF is not bad. When you go to this multi-team scenario like security is inherently in because of the nature of the work we have to do, it starts to fall apart because what is job size here? How do we actually think about what job size is? And again, theory of constraints actually starts to give us an answer to this question. So we went from constraint unaware to constraint aware. Has job size fundamentally changed here? No. No, we still we got more work done without actually change. We still got all the same amount of work done, but instead we actually managed to get more done by moving work around. So job size didn't actually fundamentally did not change. And when you're doing WSGF or any other kind of economic model where you're trying to go effort, in a multi-team scenario, effort is impact to the constraint. Everything else doesn't matter. It's purely based on how much work does this give the constraint to do. That's how you figure out this, val this um, formula to figure out how much value you're going to get from here. So as I've said a couple of times, when the constraint is outside the team, what you can do, the easiest thing to do, is to shape the work to the system. So when you're looking at security and kind of go, well, how do we get as much done as possible, you need to look at, well, based on this, the work we're looking at, where is the constraint and therefore how much work am I asking the constraint to do? That's the sum you need to be able to do in order to actually maximize value over unit time and get more work done. And this is something that I've yet to meet an enterprise doing this <laughs> um, before I start talking to them about it. And just to point out that the work shape dictates the constraint in here. So you see I've changed the shape of the work slightly here, so there's a lot more orange work for whatever that actually is. And because in, in this sense, actually, when you actually play this through, the quickest team, that is product team two, becomes the constraint because they're being asked to do way more work than anyone else. So they actually become the constraint. So it's not necessarily the slowest team that will be the constraint. It is dictated by the shape of the work, which is why changing the shape of the work is so important. What about story points? Um, so yeah, a bit of a rant coming. I hate story points. Um, I think most engineers do. Um, planning poker, yeah, uh, less said the better. So if we change from the model that we had, where it was all talking about lead time and how long things to take to get done is to change it to points, everything starts to fall apart very quickly. So you'll end up with something like this that's talking, you know, average velocity is different for each team, all that kind of stuff. Maybe we can do something here, maybe. But then when you actually look a little bit deeper, Ideally, if you're doing agile in a way that makes sense, you'll end up with this position where maybe people's sprint lengths are different. 
and that kind of stuff. So you actually got 80 points every four weeks for product team two. Everyone else is working on a two-week sprint. How do you actually reconcile this? Because you can't just take an 80 point divided by two and get it 40 points done every two weeks. And the best example of this is burn down charts. Has anyone actually done a sprint where the burn down chart looked like this? <laughs> You're a better person than me. I'd love to talk to you about this later, but for the rest of Yeah, like that. <laughs> Exactly, this, this is what we see, right? When, you, when you're looking at velocity and story points as your bit, there's so much gaming you can do because you're looking at a particular level of granularity and there's yeah, all manner of different things. You can pull more work in, you can kind of push stuff aside, you can do all weird and wonderful stuff to make it look like velocity is great, but actually the process underneath is arguably very unhealthy. So. Moving on from that to chasing predictability, how do we actually get to that point where that model I showed where everything's measured in weeks is something you can learn to rely on. It's predictable, because that's fundamentally what you need. You need to be able to predict forward in time and have a good level of confidence that your prediction will hold. So you need a stable system to make things predictable. You need to be con the system that is doing the work, you need it to be consistent. What I showed you was a stable system, because I kind of jumped to an idealized state to make my point earlier. And an unstable system will often look something like this, where you see for each of the product teams, it's no longer the average is kind of um, three weeks or one week. Instead, you've got this giant variance in there. It's, could be two weeks, could be five. Good luck with that. Could be three weeks, could be nine. Good luck with that. At this point, when you're trying to figure out the constraint, it gets really, really difficult because, well, do I take the nine? Do I take the three? Do I take the average? Like, what do I actually do with these numbers? So the easiest way to get an idea whether someone's like, work is predictable and consistent is to look at the cumulative flow diagram. And you may think those look pretty similar, but if I do that, they don't look so similar anymore. Right? You can see in the top left that the work in progress is constantly increasing. The team is actually struggling to get stuff done. There's, kind of, there's a whole different um, selection of different anti-patterns you can see in cumulative flow, flow diagrams. They aren't a chronically underused tool in terms of understanding Agile, whereas the bottom right, the work in progress staying pretty consistent over time, that looks predictable. It's not a guarantee it's predictable, but if it doesn't look like that, you know it's definitely not. So this is something that, you know, Jira does this, and most Agile tool that you'll find will do cumulative flow diagrams. This is a very quick way to look at, are we predictable today, or have we got work to do? And if you want to know on kind of the ins and outs of exactly how to figure out whether your system is predictable. Daniel Vacanti's book series is the best part from looking like through the agile lens at it in terms of what are the different graphs, what are the numbers, what are the common anti-patterns that you'll see and how to deal with those. They're all on LeanPub, they're fantastic. Buy them from LeanPub, not Amazon, you'll save a lot of money and he gets a lot more money, so it's pretty good. Once you've kind of done that, you have the option of doing value stream mapping to look at your process end to end in terms of what you need to do. And again, that's probably the seminal text in the space in terms of how does our process actually work? How can we change this over time? And then when you found your problems, the best place to probably go and look is continuous delivery or kind of most stuff Dave Farley or Jess talks about nowadays in terms of these are the practices that we can start to do, like automated testing and looking operationally and all those kind of things to get to something that's predictable. So the one thing they don't talk about in all those books, because again, most of that stuff is coming from the product team side of house. Security to be fund fundamentally isn't a product team. Now, while it's very applicable, there's one problem they never talk about, and that's this idea of protecting capacity for security in here. One of the consistent problems I see is security works gets constantly deprioritized. People get feature factory. where's the time? It's never from a lack of intent. It's never from a lack of interest that security work never gets done from the engineers. It's there's always, oh, but we need this feature now. Oh, there's a bug now. Oh, there's all this stuff now. And fundamentally, an engineering team, given the choice between tech debt and security work, they're going to go, I want to fix the tech debt, because that affects me right now. The security work kind of, and we've seen this in Australia far too much in recent years, no one cares until it goes wrong, which is a fundamental problem that I'll talk about a little bit more. For this, the best tool I have found for kind of attacking this problem and looking at this is called flow distribution, which comes from Mick Kirsten's book, Project to Product. What it looks like is this. And being a consultant, I love my mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive ways of looking at the world. But effectively, all work a team does can fit into one of these four buckets. 
So you're either working on the feature, you're working on risk, you're working on the defect, or you're working on tech debt. Those are the four kinds of work that every team does. All work falls into one of these four buckets. It's a really useful way of looking at the world. Now I'm stealing a Tim Ferriss quote to kind of go like, well, can I make one decision that prevents the next 100? It's much more efficient to go, how do we make one decision that avoids 100 decisions in the future? And this brings me around to the idea of benevolent dictatorship prioritization, which is something I coined um, badly, but it still works as an idea. But the interesting thing about these four buckets is the person that decides what goes in that bucket is just one person in here. The way, and I, when I gave this talk in Melbourne, there was an ask of like, how do you define what goes in each bucket? The, the answer is who asked for it. So your product owner or similar will you know, come up with features that you're gonna work on, maybe your BA or whatever else. Defects come from customers. Risk comes from security and just wider GRC, governance, regulation, and compliance. And debt comes from the team. Paying down tech debt comes from the team. This is really interesting because where we suffer a lot of the time is from this idea of hyperbolic discounting, which is effectively short-term gain for long-term pain. So the idea is we'll focus on features and um, defects because they're visceral, they're real, there is short-term gain to be had, even though neglecting risk and um, debt will, will cause a lot of pain in the long term. So naturally, humans, this is kind of like a human tendency that we do that makes it really hard. So what we need to do is put in a system in place that will prevent us from doing this, what comes naturally. And how you do this is you actually assign percentages to risk and debt. And you're going each sprint, or if you're doing Kanban, each unit of time, what we're going to do is make sure that 20% of the work we work on is risk and 20% is debt. Now, these percent, you don't have to use 20. I will point that out. But from doing this a number of times, if you go like the Chris Voss, never split the difference, anchoring around 20 and then being negotiated down is better than starting at 10 and getting negotiating down. So aim high, then you can hit a compromise somewhere in the middle that you're going to be happy with. If you go, we'll do 10, you'll end up with five. If you go 20, you might end up with 10 or 15. And the important thing is here, these two buckets get filled up first. You look after these two things first, and any leftover percent, any left, anything left over goes to features and defects here. Now, this is a challenging conversation to have. I understand that. I've had it many, many times. Telling a product owner we're going to take 40% of your capacity away, they're never happy. The thing is, though, once this is in place, they'll never let it go. Because <laughs> all of a sudden, a lot of conversations, a lot of debates, a lot of arguments that happen just evaporate. And they're like, oh, this is fantastic. Where was this? And one thing about the risk and debt parts, and that it then falls on security to make sure that the risk bucket always has work to be done on. If it gets to the point that the risk bucket is empty, you can slap that 20% and put it right back into features. So it's use it or lose it. So risk and debt always incent risk, um, security and the team are always incentivized to make sure there's work to be done. This is that point of kind of feeding the constraint and making sure you're constantly working on stuff, is you make sure it doesn't need to be a backlog for the next three years, but there needs to always be something. The next high priority item needs to always be there. So as it get as it gets pulled in, there's always something there. Because if there's nothing to pull in, then product owner go, OK, cool, I'm going to add a new feature in, which is fine, because you've come to an agreement about how you're going to work. With this in place, you can start to hit something that looks stable. With this in place, you've kind of protected the capacity on all the teams. Say you're doing all the, all the good stuff and continuous delivery, and then you've gone and added flow distribution on the top. All of a sudden, you can go, OK, we have a stable system to work against that we can push work into. And we can actually have a good idea about how long it's going to take to get done. And therefore, how do we actually do things? So after all that, where are we now? So we've, what we've done here is just maximize the system we have. We haven't necessarily changed the system all that much in terms of we've actually just maximized the potential, the latent potential that was there. So when we actually come back to the five focusing steps from earlier, all we've done here is the first three. We've found it, we've optimized it, we've subordinated to it. The next one is elevating the constraint. So what can you do here? There's generally three kind of options here. You've got shift left. Everyone knows shift left security. It's the thing that's been talked about for a long, long time now. Um, DevSecOps and all that kind of good stuff. In here, if you are going to come back for Laura's talk, who's hiding over in the corner, for the next one, she'll talk a lot more about shift left and kind of how to do the, the bits and pieces of security, how you actually start to do more DevSecOps kind of stuff and get that in there. Hopefully, with this first, you actually have time to go and do the bits and pieces to actually get stuff done. 
The next one, this is becoming more and more a thing with platform engineering, the idea of push down. So this is the idea that instead of kind of asking the team to do something, they're going to buy into our platform, whether it's a cube cluster or something else, and it will be handled for them, like TLS certificates or certain levels of identity and all those kind of things. Like they're going to have a platform team that takes care of it for them. So instead, you're pushing it down away from the team. The more interesting one, and the one that doesn't get talked about anywhere near enough, is this idea of moving empowerment around. So actually changing who is empowered to do different things and seeing what you can do there. And this is kind of more in more modern times where I kind of play on the day to day is actually looking at where empowerment and accountability lies across businesses to come up with something that's going to be more performant. The kind of the best example I found in literature for this is Google's large scale change approach in here. And the idea is, is they've actually removed multi-team value streams. For a certain class of security bit, security piece, they've actually removed multi-teams by changing who is empowered to make a change. So fundamentally, what they have is the accountability for any service. That still is for the product team. The service being up and available and all that kind of stuff that still is with the product teams and potentially SRE. The empowerment piece is what's changed. So instead, they've given, they've empowered their security personnel to go and make changes autonomously for certain classes of change. So log4j, because yeah, that, this was an interesting time to be consulting at enterprises when my entire stakeholder map just disappeared overnight um, because all of a sudden they had to go and fix log4j everywhere. The way Google works, I'm not suggesting that you do this. You are not Google unless you're Jez. And you have different constraints on how you do this. But effectively, they, they work in this giant monorepo. All Google Code lives in one repo together. And for every dependency, that dependency is in one place in that repo. So effectively, to change log4j, to like move it up to a version that was patched, they had to make one change. And security were able to make that change whenever it suited them. They didn't have to talk to anyone else about making this change. The way it works for them is, yeah, if, you, if I make a change, say I patch a patch of vulnerable dependency, that then proliferates through all the services, goes through all their continuous delivery pipelines all the ways out of there. If your service breaks in prod because of that, that is your fault for not having good enough tests and everything else around that and being able to do all the kind of the operational maturity stuff in here. But now security don't have to go, please, can you go and patch your dependencies? No, I'm going to go do it for you. If it blows up, that's your fault. You should have done better. It's a really interesting change in here to make this happen. But fundamentally, where this kind of falls apart for a lot of enterprises is Google have world class, well, world leading development and operations, which allows them to do this. Most enterprises and a lot of businesses are not set up today to be able to move this empowerment around like this. You're not, you're, um, a lot of service teams and product teams are not comfortable with the idea that someone else can go make a change and the pager might blow up and it might be their problem. So this is hard to do. You can start to do it. It requires engineering rigor. Again, the continuous delivery practices and all that kind of stuff will get you much close to the rigor required to do this. And this is fundamentally a change in operating model, which is where I earn my management consulting dollars, kind of using that word a lot and putting it on slides and trying to change things. But it's a really interesting idea around how do you actually change who is empowered and who is accountable for things to fix a problem in a way that will be much, much easier over the long term because you reduce all the kind of coordination that needs to happen across the business. So kind of cycle back again. I've kind of run under time, which is good. Um, but the three things, again, I'm going to kind of circle back that I hope you take away from this is understanding how workflows is fundamental. You need to understand how this works. If you work in any function in the business that relies on getting other people to do things, this is the most important thing. If you don't have this, you can't actually get, you know, you can't make the enterprise actually or your business do anything, or you kind of just, you know, the SRE quote of hope is not a strategy. You're just hoping that things are going to get done the way you want them to be. The second is you need to be constraint aware. Again, I was talking about kind of the engineer, engineering arrogance that went around theory of constraints going, oh, we do knowledge work. We're different. No, it still applies. There are ways of looking at the world and modeling the world to make it apply. And the fundamental thing about theory of constraints is it does scale. It doesn't care how big your system is. As you model more of the system, you find different constraints. But fundamentally, theory of constraints doesn't care. It's not like agile that kind of falls apart when you take it beyond the team. Theory of constraints will help you 
however large a team set of teams you're looking at, there is always the constraint, the, thing, the five focus steps always apply. And the third one is, yeah, Agile doesn't scale across teams. You can't make security kind of work like Agile, like treat it like a product team like most Agile frameworks do. It doesn't fit, it doesn't work. There are definite arguments are made around most of the Agile frameworks don't work at all, no matter what your context, but still, for security, it really doesn't do that. Now, just show of hands, who works in a place that uses Safe or Less or any of the others today? A few? Wow, there's a lot of very lucky people in the audience. Um, I'll just end with a bad joke, because you know I promised one, but Agile release trains the safe versions of the trolley problem. <laughs> it's how, how many teams can we kill at once by smashing them together? All right, that's, that's all I had. Thank you very much. <laughs>